This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 750, recorded on April 30th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Uh, out my window, I see clouds. It's breezy. Temperatures in the low 60s. Typical late of the April month day. Um, looking forward to some warmer weather and some fly hatches on some rivers. It's very windy today, Dixon. It is. It's Does wind. that making noise in your office? Yeah, it, it is. It is, yeah. Unfortunately, Sorry to hear that. these days are limited, though, uh, soon to move out of here and to a quieter place. Exactly. exactly. One would hope. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 12 Celsius. It started out really yucky this morning <laughs> and uh, it's nice blue sky, puffy clouds. Oh, good. From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. 68 degrees and raining. Wow. Uh, and it'll be raining through tomorrow, and we need it, so it's welcome. You do need it. You do need it. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, we've got 58 Fahrenheit, 14C, and it's um, uh, cloudy and breezy and kind of not quite nice, but it's supposed to get nicer this weekend. And we have a cat in the chair, right? Yes, there's a cat on the chair. <laughs> Excellent. Being infected by the cateriophage. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, who would like to remind listeners about the vaccine education town halls? Kathy would. Sure. Uh, this is your reminder. ASV.org slash education. Tell your friends. These are really good events where you can get your questions answered. Your friends can get your qu their questions answered. Um, we want to get more shots in more arms. And if we can answer questions and help people do that, we want to do it. So, Check it out, asv.org slash education. They're free. Uh, Rich has been one of the co-hosts at them, so he could tell more about them. But I think you probably know enough from this. Do it. I, I think the important thing is to, I, most TWIV listeners don't need this, okay? But they may have friends who do, okay? So any questions you have, please uh, send your friends. Or if you have questions, come and join us. Okay, and uh, uh, it's it's an open open session. All, all questions are legitimate. Uh, Kathy, why don't you do that follow up now? Sure, I had a follow up about the land grant uh, institutions. So this is based on the Morrill Act of 1862, spelled M O R R I L L. Uh, so it was during uh, Abraham Lincoln's presidency, and. Um, uh, my friend and fellow Purdue and UCSD alumna Beth said that uh, we, we didn't get enough of the information about land grant out there. It's not just agriculture, it's engineering, forestry, veterinary medicine, environmental science, experiment stations, community education, economics, and finance. And she says, um, like her, 30 years ago, uh, we didn't mention cooperative extension services whose sole purpose is to bring science and education to people of each state. So I, of course, went to Purdue, which is a land-grant institution. I mentioned that UC uh, University of California is a C-grant institution. And then a listener pointed out that Michigan State is, but University of Michigan is not. Also, I wanted to point out that UGA, where I was, uh, is also both land grant and C grant. And U of M is not a land grant institution, institution, although, quote, it benefited from earlier grants of land from the federal government. So they're kind of trying to be a pseudo land grant uh, institution. So there you have it. More facts about land grant. Okay. I'm Nat enriched. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. We had a bunch of emails. We read one last time about that as well. Okay. Uh, we have a paper and a snippet for you today. It's Friday. It is non-COVID day. I shouldn't say that because now people are going to turn it off, but there's a lot of email coming up <laughs> on COVID. So stay tuned, uh, but also learn some uh, virology be for the next pandemic, you know, yes. <laughs> there'll be one. Actually, uh, the snippet is relevant to the next pandemic. It is. So, it is. Yes. So the, uh, 
The paper actually continues what has become an ARC now, respiratory syncytial virus ARC. <laughs> we did a very nice paper a few weeks ago. And now we have from Nature Microbiology detection of respiratory syncytial virus defective genomes in nasal secretions is associated with distinct clinical outcomes. The uh, two co-first authors are F Sebastian Felt and Jan Sun, and then uh, the, the PI is Carolina Lopez, who was on TWIV 460, September 2017. And uh, I just noticed Yan Sun. So I, yesterday I, I Googled uh, copyback DVG and Yan Sun's lab came up at the University of Rochester with a very nice figure, which I used in my blog post. So I'm, I'm now realizing that that's where that person came from. Let's can see. We, um, can we put that figure in the show notes as well? Well, we, yeah, we got some others too, but we yeah. could put it in there. That, that one in particular, this is a this is the CBDVG we'll be talking about a little bit and we'll explain that. But it's it's something that is much, much easier to understand with a picture. Yeah, but I'll put the one that's uh, in, in there. So let's see, 113. And this comes from the University of Pennsylvania, Imperial College London, Merck. Emory University, Washington University, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Vanderbilt University. Yes, so Yan Sun, present address, University of Rochester. It's like the third hit if you search CBDVG. Sounds like that old club here in New York City, for those of you who may remember. CBGBs. Right, <laughs> OMFUG, yeah. Yes. And, and Carolina has moved to... Washington, Washington University. That's right. She left behind the sandbox for science, which was the title of that episode uh, when she was at Penn. Penn, a great sandbox for science. So this is about respiratory syncytial virus, uh, which of course we discussed as an important respiratory pathogen, particularly in uh, children under the age of five, but also in older people immunosuppressed people, and they have a, a number here. In 2015, 27,300 hospital deaths globally in children caused by RSV infection. And uh, the only thing we have to take care of it is palivizumab, a, a monoclonal antibody. No vaccines, no treatments, um, and no way of knowing uh, if someone's infected, what the outcome is going to be. Is it going to be a severe outcome or mild? You know, that's always the question with many infections. And that's where this topic of defective viral genomes come back. So in general, the defective viral genome is a genome that's missing something so it can't do it on its own. It needs a helper virus. And the defective genome can be you know, missing sequences in the middle, or as you'll, you'll see here, it can arise by a, a weird uh, mechanism, but essentially they need a helper, but then they can also interfere with the helper, which is why they're called defective interfering uh, viral genomes. Although that was the original name when they were discovered in the 70s, um, and now they're just called defective uh, viral genomes. They've taken out the interfering part. Well, they don't always interfere. They don't always interfere. Of course, when they were first discovered, they that was their cardinal property. So now they're defective viral genomes. And the ones in this paper are the copyback type, CBDVG. Say it really fast and you get a TWIV mug. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you, though. So the respiratory syncytial virus, a negative stranded RNA genome. Imagine this genome gets in the cell along with an RNA polymerase. And the polymerase is at the three prime end and it begins to copy. You know, most of the time it goes all the way to the other end and makes a copy or it makes messenger RNAs. But sometimes it just stops and the polymerase comes off and it turns around and begins copying what it just made. <laughs> right? A little bit. There's actually specific points where this happens. And the polymerase detaches from the negative strand template and then it goes down, down a little on the plus strand piece it's just made, and it copies it. So what you get is a little double-stranded piece with a loop at the end. And that's what this so copyback DVG is. Is that a palindrome by any chance? 
uh, uh, the the if if the well if you were to unfold that double stranded bit yeah and compare the sequences yes it would be a palindrome right Thank they're you. complementary it's the complementary strand right yeah. because it copied so it copies the negative strand and it's going along making a positive strand and yeah. then it pops off and then it comes along and copies the positive strand yeah and makes a negative strand and that those two pieces since this complementary sequence will stick together and you get this loop structure and again this is something that we'll have a picture in the show notes that will make it a lot easier to understand after you finish driving or whatever you're doing uh, alan, the, alan uh, it, can you uh, raise your volume a bit alan oh yeah is this yeah it's there good you go. there you go okay thank you so uh these the, these sorts of structures uh pop up um sorts of nucleic acid structures pop up here and there and uh just because it's evocative i think it's useful to think of it as a panhandle structure mm -hmm. yes where the double stranded bit would be the handle and the single stranded loop would be the pan yeah yeah just think of it a nice like a true floridian a nice cast iron <laughs> pan right heavy yep there really, you go really nice i have one that was given to me as a an engagement present so it's now 50 years old wow <laughs> And it's a beautiful pan. Do you ever like put things in it and put it in the oven? Uh, no. You don't do that? No. Though I just recently, I'll get to this eventually. <laughs> My brother on this recent trip I took gave me a sourdough starter that he got from his daughter. Ah. So now I've uh, uh, started on that. I will kind of leave it for there for for that except to say that uh, the the recommended res, uh, vessel for cooking sourdough in is a dutch oven yep and so i have this old thing that's up they're uh, obsolete now i mean they're antiques now but was also given to me for a wedding present given to us that's a porcelain coated cast iron casserole hmm. desco ware nice okay same sort of thing all these old cat that of course goes in the oven yes. that's where that came from yeah i got I, I've, a, put, <laughs> I've put an iron skillet in the oven for dishes where you you start out like a meunier um you start out and you you yeah. fry the fish on one side and then you flip it over and pop it in the oven yeah, it's very yeah, handy you can, i like that idea you can do yeah. that with meats also you sear it on the stove yeah. and then you pop it in the oven i got a for christmas a, a dutch oven which is cast iron and it's porcelain coated it's lovely and um for Thanksgiving, I seared a couple of duck uh, breasts in it on the stove and then stuck it in nice. the oven for 250 degrees for four hours. And I was amazed at how crispy it came out after such a low temperature, right? It was yeah. great. Just great. That's the way to do duck. I think this is just absolutely a classic digression. Yes. From, <laughs> this is so do I. Classic twib, <laughs> classic twib twib. digression <laughs> from copy back defective genomes to uh, how to cook duck, how to cook yeah. duck. And i'm i'm gonna send you all a really good poached fish recipe that starts Ooh. on the stove and cast iron and oh, ends cool. up in the oven perfect well you said panhandle man i just thinking of yeah. i'd like some eggs right now actually yeah. <laughs> rich you have an egg dish that you shared with us a long time ago eggs benedict there? dude there you go there you go there eggs you go benedict one of these there days go. there you go <laughs> All right, so back to uh, panhandles. <laughs> well, we're actually doing panhandles, yeah, but uh, yeah. Um, pan these defective. Just be careful you don't grab that handle when you pull it out of the oven. <laughs> That's it right. It is hot. Yeah, it is hot. <laughs> the incubator. The, these uh, defective genomes, they, um, as I said, they take away materials from the helper virus so they can interfere with them. And so, but they also, because they stimulate uh, host innate responses. They're, you know, they're, they're double-stranded RNA, and they're very good at, at stimulating that. And therefore, you know, from when they were first discovered um, in the 70s, it was, it was thought to, they were thought to modulate pathogenesis in some way, but it wasn't until much later that the evidence for that arose. And now we have even more, and as you'll see in this paper, uh, even more. Is this like shooting yourself in the foot? <laughs> well, that's a good question, Dixon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, these, these defective <laughs> genomes arise, right? And the question is, are, are they are they facilitating reproduction or spread in some way, or are they really shooting yourself in the foot? That's a good question. I don't think we have an answer for that. Yeah. Or can they be induced? Can you induce them? Uh, in a way, 
Okay. Uh, in some systems, you can at this least, like in, I mean, it something. happens spontaneously, but you can encourage their accumulation by doing high multiplicity right. passage. Yeah. Because yeah. if you, I mean, in a patient, oh, in a I'm patient, talking about a patient now. Not that I'm aware. Well, that's, that's a good question friggin'. that will come up with, you know, what stimulates okay. their formation, okay. but uh, we'll come yeah, to right. that. But, you know, and, and with polio, for example, you have to pass at high multiplicity for like 40 or 50 passes before you get any defective genomes. But with others, I think it's relatively easy. So um, uh, I want to I want to communicate uh, uh, an image that's in my head all the time when I'm thinking about this stuff, because I've learned to kind of think like a virus in a way, or at least a, a culture of viruses. And I picture in my head, actually, uh, a monolayer of cells. So my picture has, you know, a hundred or a thousand cells in it. Uh, some of which are, some or all of which, depending on the circumstances, are infected. Okay. And you have to be able to differentiate in your he head between cells that are initially infected with a single virus particle and cells that are infected with multiple virus particles. And one of the important things about this is that these defective genomes, uh, as we said, they need helpers, but I want people to understand what that means is that in any given individual cell, in order for one of these things to replicate, there has to be in the same cell, a fully competent virus, or at least mostly competent that can provide the replication factors necessary for this little otherwise defective piece of nucleic acid to replicate. And the, re <clears throat> the reason it's defective, of course, is because it's just a portion of the genome. So it doesn't have all the hardware that it needs. So if one of these defective, getting back to the RSV, CBDVGs, you've got this piece and a loop and a complement of the piece. And it, if that gets into, if that gets packaged and gets into the next cell, it's going to sit there waiting to be replicated by a polymerase that it can't make. So it has the handle, but not the pan. And the pan is important. <laughs> Yes, for the pan is, the other yes. it's missing, it's missing the whole duck. Now, <laughs> this is all correct, except we learned a few weeks ago that apparently respiratory syncytial virus can package both full length and defective genomes, remember, which is a total new thing. Right. So true. I think there are some cases where it all comes in together, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can deliver. Yes. You can deliver to the cell. You still need both in the cell in That's order right. for the defective That's particle, right. but they can be delivered in a single virus yeah, particle. Yes, right. that was a um, a revelation for me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, but that there's really? that there's enough space that you can pack extra. Yeah, nine. Nine. You, right. you would really be shooting yourself in the foot by doing that. Number too, nine. Shooting yourself in the foot is the is the. ML. Yes. Number nine. So the uh, previous, these, these uh, Carolina Lopez uh, group have, have been working on these uh, defective genomes for some time. And they have previously shown that you can actually find them in patients, respiratory syncytial virus infected uh, pediatric patients. You do nasal washes, you can find these defective genomes. And by the way, because they have both plus and minus strands, you can make a nice PCR assay to assay them specifically apart from the genome. And that's a key part of this research. And they, they found a, a correlation between the presence of these defective genomes and the production of antiviral genes, the expression of antiviral genes. Um, and uh, the, there's some hint that um, when they appear in an infection impacts se disease severity. And this is the uh, this is what they want to examine in this paper. And it, I gather that the data on that have been kind of difficult to interpret, like some some evidence that it may increase or some evidence it may decrease disease severity. And mm -hmm. I mean, intuitively, you'd think that a bunch of defective particles would decrease disease severity because it might interfere with the virus. But it turns out that this paper explains why this was complicated to look at. All right. All right, so for the data, they, um, they, they developed this PCR screen where they can distinguish defective genomes from full-length genomes, and they, they basically validate it using some, uh, some patient samples um, that are known to be positive for these uh, CBDVGs, and they essentially say, okay, we can distinguish defective genomes from uh, full-length genomes. 
So you can do both. You can do a PCR for both the defective and the full length genomes. So now I have let's. A question. I have a yeah. question. Yep. They show a gel of their PCR assay, mm -hmm. and it has discrete bands at 300 base pairs and 1,000 base pairs. And uh, I wonder why there are, because uh, does that mean, as you, I think, suggested before, Vincent, that there are defined places mm -hmm. where the polymerase quits and then starts to copy back? Uh, and is that yeah. what this is detecting, these discrete uh, things are yeah. Uh, so that rather than a smear, as if the polymerase at random disengaged and exactly. copied back, you're getting discrete pr products. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It'd be, it'd be interesting to know whether whether that is at all relevant to the normal biology of the virus. The, what those what those sites are, or maybe it's just RNA structure yeah, that yeah, it runs sure. into, or what? I don't no, know. I, I agree. It may have. Is this a function of the enzyme or the strand? Don't know. Could be both. Right. Could be yeah. either. Could don't be, know. Could be sequence dependent. I mean, yeah. Because normal viruses don't do that. Uh, well, other, well, some other viruses can depends do that. what you call normal. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, this virus here in the cell, you've got normal virus oh, right, particles, yes. and then you've oh, got right. the defective virus correctly. particles. So, so what's the difference? Well, the, the defectives are made during reproduction of the nor what you call the normal virus particles, right? But right. what, well, I think what Dixon is, is getting at is what well, is going to trigger this. It. And that's, well, Rich was suggesting secondary structure, or as you pointed out, it could be something in the in the enzyme that, some interaction that it reaches it's, at that point. Yeah, it's something yep. stochastic. And, and in this yes. paper, they instead of calling them normal, that's they call right, them they right, call them standard. Right. Standard. Standard. Yes. Uh, standard. Yeah, interestingly, <laughs> that's better. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> you, you, you know, up until fairly recently, for me anyway, I thought of these as, yeah, they happen in culture, but now yeah. it's becoming clear that's that they right. happen in, uh, in nature, in, in normal infections. And it makes me think that... Uh, you know, if these were really bad for the virus, that they would be selected out. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. this phenomenon would yeah. be selected out. The fact that it persists makes me wonder whether there's uh, any kind of mm -hmm. selective advantage or at least not a strong disadvantage yeah. to the yeah, virus at, yeah, at the, to do at this. At the very least, it suggests that this is not a problem for the virus because yeah. if it was, it would, as you say, be selected out. But um, it does raise the possibility maybe there is some benefit to having mm -hmm. these floating yeah. around. Kathy, I is like this. Is this virus uh, specific to people only? Sorry to interrupt, but uh, are we are we knowing well, that this is a strictly human virus? Well, what do you? It, it infects people, but you can in the lab you can infect animals with it, but it's a human virus. Okay, yeah. so there's no receptor barrier for this. So does this also happen in mice and rats and rabbits and guinea pigs and ducks? You mean the defective genomes? <laughs> Yeah, in yeah, nature exactly. or in the laboratory? So, no, no, in, in animal models that mimic human disease. I believe it does, yeah. But not okay. ducks. I don't think it reproduces in ducks. Right. I, I just threw that in because <laughs> we were discussing <laughs> I know. This, so. um, Kathy, this really, idea... Really, we are a bunch of ducks. This idea <laughs> of standard is, is interesting. I like that. Instead of saying normal behavior, let's just say standard behavior. Standard behavior, <laughs> I yes. like that. Standard Okay, so uh, patients, they have a number of cohorts, uh, and this is the power of this paper. They have cohorts of, of uh, pediatric patients. Uh, they have cohort one. They have 122 hospitalized pediatric patients. These are from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, uh, where they're RSV confirmed. And they, 100 of those, 80, 81% are positive for CBDVGs. Right. And then they can also look separately at the viral load. And, and actually, this brings up a question. I don't want to forget this. All the viral load, of course, is done by PCR. And I would just love at some point to know infectivity, <laughs> right? Because I just want to know if more load is really more infectious virus. That's all. I know in separate experiments it correlates, but I would just like it to be done here. Anyway, um, then they do, so they have a viral load, and then they do disease severity, right? Uh, the primary metric is uh, host length of hospitalization, 
in length of stay in the ICU. And what they find is that the patients who are CBDBG positive have higher viral loads and longer hospitalizations than the patients without the defective genomes. And now, if you've been listening to TWIF for the past year, you know that is an association, right? <laughs> it is not causation. And, uh, and one of the first things so, that pops to mind when you see that in your hospitalized kids is what happens to, because this is a virus that everybody gets. Yep. So what happens to all the kids that got it and didn't get hospitalized? And that's why they have another cohort. That's right. So, so Kathy, how can this be stochastic then if this is the same virus in all these kids and some have it and some don't? Now what is now what is the factor that affects whether or not it produces defective virus or not? I, I think it's still something about whether it's the polymerase or the RNA chain that when it gets to one of those breakpoints, it either keeps on going or it breaks and flips and makes a handle. But, but I this think is we a host-specific thing now, right? No. Not, no. Okay, so we're going to talk next about the non-hospitalized kids, right? No, but I'm, I'm still interested in why these hospitalized kids, the subgroup, did not have defective virus in there. They did. Why, why not? No, there, there was a group that didn't. Well, we don't there know. were some that did not. There or, there which is why. Undetectable. We, we do yeah, not why? know. We do not know. know. If, if you need to know, Dixon, we're not going to answer the, the question. Were they in the hospital for the same time? Did they receive the drug that you were mentioning before for this infection? Did they all get the same drug? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't recall that they mentioned that here. Yeah, if, I think we have information. If, if there was anything special about this group, it was not mentioned in the paper. So we know yeah, Dixon They is, are all being treated at the same hospital. But so it I appears to be a special group, though, right? What? Com with I don't know. the title of this paper. The ones with the, um, the CBDVGs had more virus and longer hospitalization right. stay. Right. That's all we know. Right. 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 I mean, the as you will see, we think the DV, the CBDVG is a responsible for more hospitalization, but we don't know in the end, right? But that's the idea. Yeah, I have a question about that when we get there too. So the, the other sure thing that. they look at in this cohort, they do a transcriptome profile from the nasal wash to see what antiviral genes are expressed. And they find that the patients with the defective genomes have higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, TNF-alpha, and so forth. So that's another data point. So with when you have a CBDVG in this cohort of patients, you have more viral load, you stay in the hospital longer, and you have more inflammatory cytokines, right? Which makes sense when you think about these, um, the structure of these DVGs with the double-stranded RNA in them. Yeah. Double-stranded yeah. RNA sets off alarm bells to the, to the cell and to the host. Hey, you're virally infected, and that triggers a specific uh, uh, inflammatory antiviral response. Right. Though, of course, we don't know, and this is, as, as we've already suggested, the crux of the paper. We don't know. All we have is correlation here. That's yes. right. We That's don't right. know what's cause and what's effect. You could prob, although, exactly. Alan, I went exactly. through the same thought process as you, you could probably construct arguments to say that uh, if you do induce some sort of antiviral response, it, the, the consequence of that might be the accumulation of these DVGs. Right. Yeah, yeah. You don't know yeah. which, yes, you're absolutely right. Cause and yeah. effect, right. Yeah, my my simple way of thinking about it, and we haven't talked about this part yet, is that the early versus late thing is that, you know, early the DVGs may be helping control, but if there's not enough control, they continue and viral genome replication continues and you just get more mm -hmm. of them. And at late times, there's just more of them because there's more of everything. That's a snowball effect than you think. Right. right. So we should probably now move to the other I think, cohorts, uh, right? I think uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, you can take what you think is the right, uh, right cause and effect, but it may not be. And, right. and you have to do the experiments right. to prove and, it. And, and, they're, and they're pretty careful to talk all the way through about association. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's fine. They, all right. So then they have a second cohort of non-hospitalized children who are nevertheless uh, confirmed to have RSV infection. They have 73 of those. Um, and, and this also has a hospitalized 
cohort as well of uh, 27 patients. Um, and among these 73 non-hospitalized patients, uh, 72% of them, 53 had CBDVGs by PCR. Um, now, it, it, and this is how it differs from cohort one. The, the ones that are positive had similar symptoms. The non-hospitalized patients, the positive, the defective positive and negative had similar symptoms, yet uh, they had higher viral loads um, in, in the de defective genome positive patients. So here you have a different scenario, right? Now, if you're not hospitalized, you can still have these CBDVGs, you can still have high loads, but you're, you don't have, you're not very sick, right? Because you're not you're hospitalized. You're no sicker than the people who don't have the DVGs, yeah. the defective genomes. Yeah. So, right. But, and then that, that makes sense in a way because they're not hospitalized. They're not as sick, so they're not going to the hospital. Yeah. Right. But, um, but you don't see even, so there's, there's hospitalization at the extreme end, but then, you know, you've got severe cough and mild cough and you could have milder and milder symptoms. You can be totally asymptomatic with this virus too. Um, but we don't see any kind of a difference like the asymptomatic ones don't have DVGs or anything like that. Yes. So, so there's no, yeah. There, there's really nothing to distinguish the the symptoms within this based on defective genomes, whereas in the hospitalized group, there's a clear distinction. That's right. I have another question, That's right. and that is, um, of all the children who become infected in a given time zone, how many of those, let's say out of a thousand, how many of those would end up in the hospital on average? I don't, I don't know. I don't have that statistic. I mean, is this a, a virus that, doesn't cause much disease, but when it does, it causes serious disease, and everybody else goes scot free. I, it is uh, it is mostly mild, given that yeah. everybody gets it by age two. I mean, I'm thinking about West right, Nile, and most kids instance. do not go to the hospital by age two, right? Right, that's true. So I think it's safe to say the majority of kids are not going to be hospitalized when they get RSV. Right. So when you're when you're a young adult, everybody's seropositive positive for RSV. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But you remember Back if you. If you are infected in the first six months, which can happen, you can then you have more serious disease because your your airways are very small, and this makes them even smaller. Sure. And then that's and a big your issue. maternal antibodies are gone too. And the the difference between the non hospitalized cohort and the hospitalized cohort, at least with respect to this disease severity, <clears throat> is that we don't have that same kind of measure of disease severity for the hospitalized cohort. There's at least in the data that's shown here. You know, in this figure three where we're looking at the non-hospitalized, we have the disease severity score in part C, but we don't have that in in the hospitalized patients. So I, I think we, we can't quite make that comparison that, that maybe Dixon was getting at. They're not being measured on the same scale. Right. Yeah. And I have the feeling that this disease severity scale for the non-hospitalized patients is self-reported. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. so. Where were these patients from, by the way? Not uh, Philadelphia, presumably. No, they're, yeah. I think they're all. I think all they probably are. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh, by the way, uh, Dixon, okay. here are some numbers for you. Yes. Uh, by 18 months of age, 87% of in infants have experienced an RSV infection. Good heavens. And uh, of those infected, 2 to 3% develop bronchiolitis from necessitating hospitalization. Okay. Okay. So I would say 95% of them get off with, uh, 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 without being hospitalized. Is that and a probably of... most of them just get off with a cold or right. an asymptomatic infection. So I would imagine that every newborn has maternal antibody against this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interestingly, you would think the, uh, most the risk of serious infection is highest in the first six months of life. First six. So that, to me, yeah. suggests that maybe the maternal protection is not real strong. You probably right need to have <laughs> you probably need to have mucosal antibody for uh, protection, and you know right. you get serum antibodies from your mom. Right. But if you're not breastfed, then you're not going to get the that's mucosal. Right. Ah, that's right. So that's right. I don't know if what's going on there, but that could be part no of it. IgA, otherwise, that's right. Um, um, what's I going to say? Rich, is that a global number or a U.S. number? Uh, I'm, 
I, I confess I'm reading out of Wikipedia. Here. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, no and shot. I do not know. All right. No problem. All right. So finally, oh, uh, 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 global. Global. Okay. I global. bet it's underreported because right, a lot of countries sure. you have oh, no sure. idea. Uh, so also on this cohort uh, of non-hospitalized patients, they looked at cytokine uh, transcripts and they get higher expression of the cytokine genes, pro-inflammatory in the patients with the DVGs, the CBDVGs, um, you know, IL-6, TNF-alpha and so forth. So if you don't have- Which fits with the hospitalized group data. Right. Yeah, when you have the CBDVG, you have more of these uh, inflammatory cytokine RNAs. That's right. So they're thinking, you know, what's going to explain this? And they say, well, you know, these uh, these non-hospitalized patients, they had symptoms earlier in the infection, so they were sampled earlier. So maybe it's a kinetic thing about DVG. So let's look. Uh, let's look at that. Um, so that they first ask is is uh, does whether you have CBDVG or not depend on the viral load, which I think Dixon was kind of getting at earlier. You know, if you have more viral reproduction, do you have more uh, CBDVGs? I know, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> it, but said it's not what you were asking. No, no, no. no. I just thank you because you you took it to the next step. That's fine. No, no. I, I listen to you, Dixon, most of the time. <laughs> you know, one percent of the time. Um, <laughs> the other defect two to three, two to three percent. <laughs> I, I had a question. Just to interject here, does coronavirus produce defective viruses? Uh, I do not know. Because you know, you look at what's happening right now in that pandemic, and people are developing cytokine storms and all kinds of other things as an after effect, and it sounds. I, I sense that something similar might be going on here. You know, I think we but, would have. Uh, I don't know. I shouldn't say that now. Yeah, they are. They do make good defective. Looked? They do make defective particles. Coronaviruses do do. So, Whether Dixon they have played a role in the pathogenesis, I think, yeah, right, is a good right. question. Open for discussion. Yeah, I think it's worth yeah. looking at. Yeah, for sure. In fact, the Sun Lab comes up when you um, Google that. Uh, yeah, here's <laughs> a. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I got this right. Here's a paper Is that by also, uh, Kathy? <laughs> uh, Marco Vignuzzi and Carolina Lopez. Uh, I want to make sure this is coronavirus. I'll look at it. Go ahead. So I, th this is an interesting experiment where they, they want to know if, if CBDVG appearance is independent of viral load. They actually experimentally infect healthy adults. Now their average age, 22 years of age with 10 to the fourth, 10,000 PFU of what they call RSV AM37. Now, I don't know if that's an attenuated virus or what. Um, but um, then they take nasal samples and they assay viral load. They actually assay antibody as well, uh, IgA and CBDVG. And basically they conclude that you don't need to have high viral load to see CBDVGs because they have some people that have a low load and some people intermediate and high and they all can make CBDVGs. But I thought that was interesting that they were actually able to challenge or infect um, healthy adults. Yeah, because so when you work on a virus that has infected everybody by the time they were two, yeah. um, right. I mean, if they're walking around healthy, they obviously are not going to be hurt by an RSV infection because it already would have happened. No. Yeah. So the other question is then, do the people who suffer most from this, are they non-secretors in terms of IgA? You mean the babies that uh, get very sick? There is a subpopulation of people that do not secrete IgA. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there are immunosuppressed people who get very sick. Because they can't protein. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I think we don't have an answer to that. So, M30... That's not, that's not 2 to 3% of the population, so I think... I don't know, what is it? Count for it's, it's, it's not that uncommon, okay. though, because Giardia infection behaves the same mm -hmm. way in terms of uh, hypersensitivity and susceptibility. So M37 is not attenuated. It's just another isolate. Okay. So I, I just want to file that because I didn't know you could infect people with RSV. So that's good to know. So now we have uh, rhinovirus, RSV, and influenza virus, and norovirus. Let's not forget that. <laughs> Yeah, you can infect so, people. Dixon, you're, you're saying this is an IgA deficiency? Is that what you were talking about a, for Giardia? Not a deficiency, the inability to secrete it. 
Oh. It's not a okay. deficiency in IgA. It's a, they don't make peace protein, which links them together mm. in the, the mucosa. Secretory okay. peace, right? That is exactly right. Peace, Dixon. Exactly right. Peace. 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 <laughs> okay. So now back to the cohorts. Um, now we're going to look at the kinetics of CBDVG and, and disease. Um, so they have cohort three. Um, where's cohort three? We didn't talk about cohort three before, right? Mm, cohort three. Oh, those are the adults. Yeah. That they held, that they infected. Yeah, the cohort three, median 22 years, they infected them. So now we're looking in this cohort uh, based on when you detect the CB, CBDVGs. And they have, you know, three early cutoffs, days three, five, and six post-infection. And then they have people that don't make them early, they make them late. Okay, so they have three categories of early makers, CBDVG makers, and one late category. And um, then they say, okay, let's look at total load and disease severity score using all of these cutoffs. So the early groups have lower, the early groups, meaning that, that you can pick up CBDVG really early, day three, five, or six, they have lower disease severity scores and they have lower total viral load than the late groups, right? The earlier you make uh, CBDVG, the less virus you seem to make and the less disease you seem to have. Was the disease severity statistically significant on that cohort? 5B. I don't recall. Do you know? Yeah, I, think, I think maybe the... The severity was not. Yeah. I mean, it it looks kind of suggestive, but it's not. The range is so huge. Um, now, this is um, this is the infected cohort, right? The challenge right. cohort? Right. These are the experimentally infected. So they probably don't get very sick, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do this. That's right. what I'm guessing. One would hope not. I guess nobody that age group dies from this infection. Yeah. So they said we eliminated from the analysis people three people who didn't have any symptoms. So they, they develop some symptoms, but I'm sure they don't require hospitalization. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do this, so right? I all have right. a question here, too, because these people were all infected at the age of two years or six months oh, old. Yes, They're of course. They all got the antibodies. Of so course. now you've got people that are responding in a secondary response to this yes. virus. Yeah. No, it is not the perfect group, of course. It's a course. very different situation. Yes, yes. you're absolutely very right. Very different. You cannot take naive infants and do this experiment with them. No, of course not. Of course <laughs> right. not. But the, and That's why I asked about animal models. That's why I asked yeah, about yeah, animal sure. models. Right. So the important thing they get out of this experiment, though, is the lack of a correlation between DVGs and viral load. Right. And that tells us something important, which is that this is not just a surrogate measure of viral load. The DVGs are actually a different thing that is associating with um, right. disease severity in the hospitalized patients. So are all these hospitalized children also secondarily infected? Because they got it at the age of six months, first of all. Well, we don't have the, they hadn't provide that data. That's an interesting question. I don't know hmm. that. Okay. Um, do we have an age span here? Let's see. They um, have to be infected pretty fast. Pediatric patients. I'm yeah, sure so in these the- are, Methods. Age range in days, and they're, it looks like they're mostly under a year old. Mm. They could have been infected, well, These are though. initial infections, then. Yeah, these are, these are initial infections. These are all primary infections. Okay. Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so. That's in the hospital. That's cohort one. This. Um, three median age range in years. The, the adults they did. In, 18 to 50. Yeah, in adults, they looked at. Uh, age range in years, and in kids, they've got age range. In cohort one, it's median age in days. Cohort two, it's median age in weeks. So it's a little confusing looking at the table. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Right. So from that study, the early detection of CBDVGs, less severe symptoms compared to having CBDVGs late or not at all. Right. So early is good. And then the last study, they look at uh, how long the, the, the CV, not just when the CBDVGs arise, but how long they persist in the host, right? So um, some go 
beyond six days, for example, prolonged producers versus transient producers that make them for a short period of time and then stop. And they had four people. This is not a huge um, group, but they had four people out of the 18 subjects that they infected that had detectable on uh, at least two days and beyond six days post-infection. So the, the people in this prolonged group had higher load than people in the transient group. And the prolonged group had elevated disease scores as well. They have more antiviral responses, pro-inflammatory responses uh, than uh, in the prolonged group, in the prolonged group than the transient group. So they're thinking that um, people with this, in the prolonged group, they have a higher immunopathology basically and higher viral load and worse disease. So the idea here is that, you know, if you make these earlier, you're better off. If you make them late when the virus has already established and is at high loads, you make them late, you still get this inflammatory response, but it's damaging probably. It doesn't do you any good. And it's kind of like late, the late uh, inflammatory responses in COVID patients in a way. It doesn't, doesn't help you in any way, but uh, it causes disease. But I think... You know, this is a very small N for people. So they, and they do admit that they need to do a lot more people to, to sort this out. So you get, you make CBDVGs early. It helps you have a good prognosis clinically. And it uh, makes those early pro-inflammatory cytokines that reduce viral load. If you don't make the CBDVGs early, the virus gets more established, higher loads, and you have more disease. You could make... CBDVGs later, but then you make an inflammatory response and it doesn't help you. Right. So that's the that's the data. Those are the data, and they're well. They, that's right. So that's the that's the speculation from the data. Yes, that's um, what they think I mean, might these are be all, going as, on. As we've said, and as the authors point out, this is this is a correlation. This is an association. Um, but then they go in the discussion where you're allowed to do this and outline what Vincent just said, which makes a lot of sense. So right. I would like to say, just read a little bit from the very last section where they say, we propose that whether the DVGs are beneficial for or detrimental to depends on the context. Mm -hmm. And it could be the way I think of it is that at the late times, they're, they're just too late to be beneficial. And it might not be that they're detrimental at late times. They're just too late to be. Could be yeah. So you've already yeah. let the is infection establish and titers are rising. Yes, so they are not detrimental, but they haven't uh, helped control the infection early. So the, it's really stochastic, right? Because depending on when you make these, you can make them early, you can make them late. And that's going to help, may help disease outcome. Yeah. I, I have two other things that I have found. Um Immunity to the virus appears to wane over time. Individuals remain mm -hmm. susceptible to reinfection throughout their lifetime. Um, That's and right. It looks like there's about three times as many adults that are hospitalized per year than hmm. children. Um, I think that's a U.S. statistic. It was from the CDC site. Okay. So I wanted to um, go back. I've been uh, distracted. Go back to... Uh, a couple of Dixon's questions. Uh, one was uh, basically asking about the distribution of yeah, uh, these go. types of viruses. So I want to point out that RSV is in the genus orthonumovirus that also contains bovine orthonumovirus and murine orthonumovirus. So there are RSV, I would say RSV-like viruses um, in at least uh, cattle and mice. Mm -hmm. uh, moving up the taxonomy, uh, they are pneumoviruses, uh, which uh, include avian metanumovirus, human metanumovirus, and the three I already talked about. And then moving up further in the taxonomy, these are all mononegavirales, single-stranded 
uh, negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses, which includes stuff like rabies and vesicular stomatitis virus and a wide range of viruses. These things all throw off defective genomes mm -hmm. and are in a wide variety of species. So this is going to be uh, pretty commonplace. Also, I, I'm sorry. Ahead, also, I've been able to uh, confirm uh, that, yes, defective genomes occur in nature in coronaviruses. Okay? Right. Is, is, uh, is the cattle form of this uh, pneumovirus uh, economic? Does it kill off cows or cattle or cows? I don't know. I don't know. Is it a, um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, could kill it it, Dixon it vaccine, uh, cattle. It it, you should say cattle, not cows. I'm sorry, cows, cattle. Okay, cows. Cattle. Cows are female <laughs> cattle, and cattle are both. Cattle. I, we were well, told, I was worried about the. Uh, we were corrected last time, I, and I totally get it. And I I use the word <laughs> cow all the time, and it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not a cowboy. You're a cattle boy. I don't Thank know if uh, any, but nobody no, on this. No, 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 just stick with us. Stick with us for a minute. Right. So in cattle, <laughs> in, in cattle, um, I'm on Pub, PubMed now looking up RSV in cattle. Yeah, it's a pathogen, uh, yeah. Yeah, bovine RSV, uh, it does cause a respiratory disease. It seems to be important in young dairy calves, uh -huh. nursing beef calves. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so it, it hits the babies kind of like in... In humans, yeah, yeah. and yeah. predisposes them to secondary bacterial infections. Yeah, I'll be darned. Uh, I'll tell you this: the whole RSV thing fascinates me. If I were uh, starting over again, and in particular, if I had any um, uh, interest or facility for looking at, uh, you know, vaccines, I think RSV is a really hot topic because sure. it's an important pathogen, and it has been because of its. Uh, immunology, this idea that you get waning immunity yes, um, and, and reinfections, that complicates the vaccination issue. And because there have been difficulties in making uh, vaccines in the past, uh, to me, it's uh, both an important and a fascinating uh, area for yeah. this clinical is the, and basic research. This is the one where they made a vaccine and it made the disease worse in kids who yep. got yes. it. And yep. it's, you know, Bingo. I talked to Barney Graham last year in January, and he said, we, you know, it took 50 years to recover from that. And you could see it permeates wow. other vaccines because people in the talking about corona, COVID vaccines are saying, is it going to make disease worse? And the, yeah. the, the poster child yeah, yeah, for yeah, that yeah, is yeah. the RSV yeah, yeah. vaccine. Yeah. Right. Well, RS, wow. RSV and dengue are the. Yep. You know, because more here. recently there was a dengue vaccine that's got that complication. And right. um, and yeah, I mean, a pediatric population. And since you would have to test this, your, your phase two or so, you're going to have to go into really, really tiny babies um, with, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's a uh, high hurdle to clear. But it makes me it makes me wonder if the new technologies, in particular the messenger RNA technologies, won't wind up addressing this problem. Might be a way to look at that. Yeah. Yep. Can can you isolate RSV virus from the air easily? I mean, it sounds ubiquitous. It sounds like if you breathe in when you're a newborn, you've got it. No, I, well, I don't think it's floating around in the air. I think if someone no. is nearby that's infected, yeah. you, it will be exhaled. So, you know, the kids right. don't just magically just, acquire it. There's somebody near well, them the that's infected. Just, think about, I mean, two-month-old kids, they're, what are, what, who have they been around? Their parents. A lot of adults. Their parents. A lot of adults whose, whose immunity wanes and they get reinfected. Oh, yes. And that reinfection yeah. is often going to be minimally. So we're shedding virus, but we're not symptomatic. So okay. we're, we're giving right. it to the, to the it's, virus. It's kind of like the common cold coronavirus. Yeah. Got it. Right? Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay, fine. So there's, there's one other point I wanted to make. They bring this up and they say, you know, maybe this could be a way to predict the disease course, whether you have CBDVGs early or not. And they say, you know, we need to look at more patients to uh, to determine that. But uh, that could be interesting, right? If you get a person who tests positive, you don't just look at the virus, you look for CBDVG. And, you know, if they have yeah. none, then maybe you worry. And if they have some early on, that could be good. So that's kind of neat. And they also raise the possibility that if you could somehow stimulate DVG production early in infection, um, yeah. you might be able to get better outcomes. So How would you do that, true. though? How would you do yeah, that? Yeah, that's You'd have pretty, to know what caused it first. <laughs> yeah, we don't. I guess we need or some. Or maybe that's your vaccine. 
may be defective. Uh, uh, although I don't know how that would differ from giving just a double stranded RNA. Yeah, that wouldn't give uh, you any right. antigens, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. right, right. <laughs> you don't want to do that. But uh, uh, well, except that uh, you know they are potentially interfering. Yeah. So if you had yeah. the right structure that was admit. Uh, Maybe what you need is an mRNA vaccine that encodes RSV antigen and forms a loop. Ah, maybe. So it can act as a defective interfering genome, and but if you just gets a hold but if it. you're just giving them a um, an mRNA vaccine, right? That's you're going to get going to be around by the time they get in. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's not going to be around. So the, the, the it's not useful to Good have uh, that induction. But uh, yeah, it is very interesting. Okay. So uh, if you genetically engineer the baby. <laughs> no, okay. But wait, there's more. <laughs> that was a joke in case anybody. <laughs> so uh, since you're here, Alan, last week, uh, was it last week? So, someone said that the mRNA vaccines are, um, what is, what's the gene therapy? Is that right? This, they're not gene no. therapy, are they? No. no. No, no, gene no. therapy has to involve a gene, and these are, I mean, these are That's right. mRNAs. Well, but it is, yeah. but it's an mRNA it's of a gene, a gene right? to a virologist, right? No, I mean, it's, it's a, a, it's not a human. So gene therapy always genome. has to have DNA, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, it's got to do something to the well, DNA. Well, what Either, are they in RNA viruses? They are genes when they're Yeah, RNA. but then you're... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a genomic so that's the viral it's not gene. gene therapy. You're not doing gene therapy. You're not doing. <laughs> no, you're, no, not you're not doing anything to the host. We uh, <clears throat> we use lentiviruses for gene therapy, and they're RNA viruses. That's correct. Um, right, where did this come RNA up? They're RNA viruses, but they're integrating into the genome. They're they're getting reverse transcribed. It's not gene therapy. It's therapy with genes. Oh, okay. <laughs> this came up the other night. Someone said the another anti-vaxxer trope is that mRNA vaccines are actually gene therapy and they're not licensed right. as gene therapy, but that's nonsense. Right. Stop it. Stop that's nonsense. It. But they're not gene therapy. And no. I think that's I think that's the issue here is that it's, uh, you know, the, the mere fact that we have to have a discussion about it, okay, <laughs> indicates, <laughs> that, that, indicates yeah. that the vocabulary can be confusing. Yeah. Yes. All right? Yes. And therefore is susceptible to that sort of, if you like, tropism. But yes. I wouldn't call it, if I were going to call it gene anything, I wouldn't call it gene therapy. I would call it gene prophylaxis. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not therapy. No. It's prevention. Right. Trope, a new word, T-R-O-P-E-I-S-M. Different from tropism. Yes. <laughs> it's tropism. <laughs> I like that very much. <laughs> okay. We have a snippet, which uh, I had, this was published uh, last year. This was published in um, uh, 2020. I don't know what month. It doesn't say on I the front page. I couldn't figure that out either. But no, I, you know, I hate I, it. For, right? oh, uh, I, I, I hate it when they don't make the publication dates really obvious on the paper. It's not. It's so not. I had picked this out last year. In, yeah, it's, no. it's Journal of Infectious Diseases for 2020, number 221, whatever week whatever that is month or, yeah. four. but i had four. picked it out last year early last year um and it was stored away all these months and i'm going back and looking at what i picked and this was one i was interested in it's a, um, a journal of infectious diseases serological evidence for hennepa like and phila like viruses in trinidad bats and just by the way this i think was an open access paper the first one we talked about uh, was not so if you're right. So this is uh, so the um, this has a number of people on this paper who have uh, been on one of our podcasts. Uh, the last author is Vincent Munster from the Rocky Mountain Laboratories, who's been on, and I, I believe uh, he's the PI here. Then we have Tony Shounts, who's there, and uh, John Epstein, who's from the Eco Health Alliance, and Simon Anthony, who's been on Tuivo. First author is Jonathan Schultz, and this comes from Rocky Mountain Labs, which is, of course, part of NIH, Uniform Services University, University of West Indies, which is in Trinidad and Tobago, Columbia University, EcoHealth Alliance, Marshall University, and Colorado State. So this is about Hennepa viruses, which includes Hendra and Nipah viruses. We've talked about those 
more more Nipah than than Hendra actually, but uh, these are paramyxoviruses that emerged from bats and and continue to do so and cause outbreaks. Over 350 uh, human fatalities from Hendra or Nipah, and of course everyone knows uh, filoviruses, Ebola viruses. 13,700 human fatalities since 1976. And of course, uh, the, the, the Nipah and the Hendra, we, we clearly know that bats are the natural reservoirs of those. Uh, for filoviruses, we think bats are. A little harder to nail that down. But the issue is we don't know globally which bats have these viruses in them. And we need to do more surveillance. And this is this is, a, this is a surveillance of convenience, really. You may say, why Trinidad and Tobago? Well, they had some bats that they, they had. had some <laughs> bats they had caught there in 2012 that this goes yeah. back to. And so they looked, and I think that's perfectly fine to look in them and Absolutely. see what you find, because the more we look, the more we're going to find. Well, um, and in fact, um, I know when we, when Vincent and I were at the Tufts Veterinary School, mm -hmm. they, they said, you know, we've got freezers full of samples from wildlife around Massachusetts, if you know anybody. So this type of thing is scattered around where where they've got, and they, they look back at samples and say, oh, yeah, there are those bats from Trinidad. We never looked for yeah. an Nipah viruses in those, so. So I want to point out. I want to point out that these viruses, the Hanipa viruses and the filoviruses, also, if you back up the taxonomy, are in the order Mononega virales, mm -hmm. as is RSV, and uh, and sort. Of, I have to remind myself every time, and my resource is Viral Root Zone. Okay, and so every time I have to go and I'll look it up again, uh, and it's interesting because they've got the genome structures for all of these things there. And they have a lot, you know, the, the basic theme is the same uh, with, with variations. Right. So these are all in the same sort of very broad grouping of viruses as distinct from coronaviruses, which are positive sense uh, single-stranded RNA viruses and go through a different style of replication. You know, it's uh, all about knowing where to look, Rich. Oh, yeah. You don't need to remember it. Just know where to look for the information that you want. Uh, though I, <laughs> I have to, yeah, viral root zone is really important. We probably ought to make that a pick of the week again or stick it in the, you know, for the for the newbies who haven't been familiar with that. But, you know, I was just looking at stuff on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, uh, I find for material that I know something about is quite accurate. I would they do a pretty good job. For a so I, stuff, I yeah. trust it as a resource, by and large. And yeah. and crucially, they will generally provide links that yeah. you can check yourself yeah. if you're. That all anything. changed when they allowed editing. Well, no, no that, the editing yeah, thing was that's, pretty stringent. That's yeah. uh, the essence of Wikipedia has always been editing, but they they have gotten but the, more stringent about it. The other thing that you're talking about, Rich, you've said viral root zone a couple of times, but I think you just mean viral zone. Viral zone. Uh, viral zone. Well, yeah. oh, I know, I know. I've got viral, yes, it's viral zone. My link says viral zone root, which I think <laughs> is probably their home page. Their yeah. home directory, yes. yes. Right. Viral zone, so. Rich is just a big fan and he likes to root. So if you're wondering where they have found these viruses, Hennepa viruses, which is Hendra and Nipah, so Hendra, original outbreak in Hendra, Australia, uh, bats to horses to people, then Nipah, Malaysia and Singapore, bats to pigs to people. They are fruit bats, pteropid bats, Southeast Asian Australia, um, also in Africa, in Ghana, um, so African Hennepa viruses, and apparently also in Brazil. Uh, then filoviruses outside of Africa, of course, Reston came out of the Philippines, Loviu in Spain, and then Mengla, Xilang, and Huangshao viruses in China. So they're apparently all over the place. Um, and there's uh, some evidence for filoviruses not only in China, but Singapore, Bangladesh, and Hungary. So I remember when we covered the Mengla. Yeah. Because I remember hearing the woman pronounce it over and over again. <laughs> How did she <laughs> say it? Did you? Did, it so, was something like Mengla. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, we we yeah. don't say it properly. Uh, you know what amazes me is that uh, as I read this, just in the first uh, paragraph of this paper, um, they talk about uh, greater than three hundred and fifty human fatalities 
uh, since 1994 with Hendra and NEPA mm-hmm. and 13,700 uh, fatalities since 1976 with the filoviruses. And, you know, we think of these as just uh, incredibly nasty, dangerous viruses in the context of the pandemic. Okay. This is these numbers you know, look really small. The yes. numbers look really small. That, that that's not to diminish no the hazard here, uh, because you know things could happen, and it and they are have a, an incredibly high mortality rate. But the actual numbers of deaths that we've experienced so far, yeah. well, it's a warning shot, is what it is. Yes. But relative to the pandemic, it's really small. It's re- the pandemic has recalibrated us. Yes. You know? No, I think the. Uh, the issue here is that we know these viruses can cause human illness. The question is, right. are there related ones that could do more, right? <laughs> which yeah. uh, which we don't know about. Is there, so. is there a worse Ebola lurking out there somewhere? Well, and, right. you know, worse may be less pathogenic, but more transmissible, but more right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's what we, we can't just be surprised, yeah. right? No. no. Oh, wait, no, we, we were. <laughs> We, we've had enough of that. Thank you very much. I think once is enough here. So um, this study, they, as Alan said, they had captured uh, bats in February 2012, four different places, and they got six bat species. And I just love the names, flat-faced fruit bats, uh, long-tongued bats, and sack-winged bats, yellow-shouldered bats, short-tailed bats. I guess they're named about how they look, right? Yeah. <laughs> One would hope. <laughs> yeah, and Trinidad and Tobago is a lush tropical place, so you'd have all it these is, bat species and they're going to be specialized in different ways. Flying around. Right. So they did two things. They did basically, they take serum and look for antibodies that bind the glycoprotein. So they make the, the henipavirus or phy- phylovirus glycoproteins, they set up in ELISA. They look for antibodies that bind. They're not doing neutralization assays here. No newts. And then they do they do some PCR. So uh, they have 84 bats. The percentage of bat serum reactive against uh, henipavirus glycoproteins was 3.5%. Three out of 84 had antibodies that react with the glycoprotein of henipa. And six out of 84 with filovirus, that's 7%. Um, that's so a few of these have been infected with something that made an antibody that reacts with this. It doesn't have to be the same virus. It could be a related virus, right? It could be cross reactivity. And then, uh, Nipah virus, the glycoproteins, they do the same thing. Um, the, um, Nipah was 25 out of 84 and the, um, Hanipa was um, 19, 19%, 16 out of 84. So more more bats were seropositive. Some of this, uh, the numbers, uh, my impression was, depends, if I remember correctly, depends on which assay you use. Yes. One assay sure. seems to pick up a higher uh, percentage than another. One's an oh, ELISA yeah. and the oh, other's yeah. this Luminex assay, right? Yeah, yeah. and also dilutions matter. You know, you, the percentages I gave you are at a, 1 to 100, but if you go to 1 to 250, many fewer are positive. So the bottom line here is that a few bats have antibodies that cross-react. Um, but then when you go to do PCR, panviral PCR, they're all negative because none of these bats are infected. They were infected at some point, but now they're no longer infected and so uh, that's it. And, you know, it's a small sample. So, yeah. And uh, to PCR, me, five, if, they, go ahead. If, if they had amplified virus up from some of these, that would be definitive because um, it's very sensitive. And, and that would mean that bat was actively infected. Um, the, the immunology tests, it, it's very suggestive. I mean, you could have an antibody that cross reacts that's from a totally unrelated viral infection uh, in theory. But in practice, we see mostly these types of things correlate with some kind of infection of a related virus. Yeah. Yeah. They say these results are likely due to circulation of viruses that have glycoproteins antigenically related. That's all you can yeah. say. And so uh, I mean, you may say, well, you know, what does that mean? Well, they're probably related viruses in Trinidad. And I think we need to look more, but um, it's not zero, right? Right. Uh, matter of fact, I would say 5% uh, 
given the number of bats that there are flying around, is a pretty big number. Yes. <laughs> and and given the sample size, and they, they bring this up a couple of times in the discussion, you know, this is a very, very limited sample. It's, what was it, 78 bats? Yeah, 84. Um, yeah. And so not too surprising you didn't find any with an active infection. I mean, yeah, that would have been gold if you had. But um, and, and 5% of your little sample of six different species of bats suggests yeah. that these viruses are probably out there circulating. And that's that kind of fits with data from Brazil, um, where you've got other samples of bats that actually have these types of viruses in them. Yeah, so the best way to address this is to find out where they're roosting and uh, capture a, a whole bunch more, including the young ones. Mm -hmm. Well, at least sample. I mean, in this one, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they caught and euthanized them. You certainly wouldn't want to do that with large numbers of bats. But you could go out into the field, do repeated samplings. Exactly. Where you, you, exactly. You know, just take a little blood sample and do these yep. assays. Yep. Uh, way, they, I, like your thought. I like your thought of the young ones. Dixon, yes. Yes. If yes, you yes, can yes. Get at that. It reminds me of sure of when they were looking for MERS and camels. Okay. All oh, right. And uh, basically, there you find in the youngest individuals right. you can find virus, but in the older ones you find mostly antibody because it's here. the same pattern. You get kind of like if you were sampling for RSV in humans. Yep. Exactly. And interestingly enough, they're in an area where I think vampire bats exist, so they may be taking blood samples on their own, <laughs> but not of other bats, of other probably of cattle and cattle. Notice, Vincent, I said cattle, not cows. Yes. Very good. good job. No, I've been saying Thank cattle you. now all the time because I'm a that, quick learner. The, the person who wrote us, she was absolutely spot on. She said, you know, you you're so cattle fussy boys, about. Now it's Words in <laughs> virology, I'm going to be fussy about words in my field, which is... Well, that's okay. That's okay. That's right. Cattle, because right. I said those castrating are, cows. So across the range. You can't cattle castrate a cow. USA instead of cow town. I like it. <laughs> One more... Cattle tow rather than cow tow. Yeah. <laughs> One more... I, I think that's a different origin, but... Yeah. I do too. <laughs> I like where you're going with this. <laughs> One more point. <laughs> well, I like the tropism thing. Like you just got stuck on that. <laughs> One more point. They say the zoonotic and cross-species spillover potential of these novel viruses is currently unknown. And so we need to do more work, more yeah. surveillance. We need to get genomes and do experiments to answer that question. All right. Let's do a round of email. Uh, let's see here. Hmm. Let's, do, let's have Kathy answer this first one. Read Andreas it. writes... Long story short, rationale for the broad spectrum antiviral activity of niclosamide. It's a biophysical proton shuttler, no biological tar target required. Hi, Twivoids. I'm a virologist by training and used to be an avid follower of Twiv for many years. A switch in careers let me lose touch with the field for a while, but COVID drove me back to following Twiv. Wanted to comment on Twiv 742. I did my PhD on host factor targeted antivirals with Urs Greber at the University of Zurich. We identified niclosamide as a broad range antiviral back in the days. Long story short, we found that niclosamide is a biophysical protonophore. A phenotypic infection screen of approved compounds led to the initial hit, plenty of cell biology, medicinal chemistry, and biochemistry later, we concluded that niclosamide doesn't require a biological target, shown in vitro with liposome assays, etc. In simple terms, the I don't know if that's an IOPP or LOPP. Anyway, partition coefficient between water and the hydrophobic phase of niclosamide switches in a pH-dependent manner. Niclosamide becomes more hydrophilic in an acidic environment. It diffuses through membranes and preferentially carries out the proton hmm. of, for example, en endosomes. Notably, this mode of action does not require any biological target at all but one will see a lot of biological downstream effects, as in, for example, proton gradient-driven ion gradients and mechanisms controlled by these, etc. It seems that, that it seems like that niclosamide has just the right properties to affect many pathways mm -hmm. which are required for viral infections, but just enough not to affect the host too much. Mm -hmm. The IC50s reported in various models well support this mode of action to be the key driver of efficacy. After having worked in biotech and drug development for more than a decade, I'm still fascinated by the pure physicochemical mechanism explaining the, the niclosamide effect. 
Lots of implications. For example, we never managed to produce escape mutants. As a biologist, hmm. one intrinsically is biased to look for biological targets. Hence, I believe the neclosamide story is so relevant since it bridges classical cell biology with biophysics. All the best and thanks a lot for all the great work you're doing. Tuiv is my trusted source on virology and I recommend it to many of my friends and colleagues. A paper often only reaches a few people, but Twiv serves as a catalyst, bridging the world of data-driven science with the more complex world we are living in. Andreas. P.S. I hate citing myself, but <laughs> maybe relevant to the to reference the original paper. And he gives the reference where he's first author and Urs Graeber is the senior author. Cool. So this is a new concept for yeah. me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I, matter of fact, I have a little trouble getting my head around it. I'm going to have to think about this, but it's very interesting. It's an old drug. And mm -hmm. uh, I've known it for years because it's a drug that's used to treat tapeworms and a few trematodes. Mm -hmm. And we thought it inhibited their eight, it, or the tegumental ATPase that is in the outer coating of these worms, which is uh, microvillide covered. And it, they can absorb nutrients through it. They need ATP in order for that to occur. And this drug inhibits that. But it may be doing so by depleting ions. I don't know. But uh, the end result was that their ATP didn't work, and therefore they starved to death, and uh, the worms passed out of right. the body, that they is. I'm sure they passed out before they passed out of the body. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it's interesting that they should think about repurposing Drugs which have had a good uh, function for a long time, and it's still being used to treat tapeworms. This is this is a really neat concept that it's not it's not a biological yeah. target yeah, affecting yeah, yeah, the yeah, virus. Yeah. It's just yeah. making the cell inhospitable to viruses by mucking around with proton yeah. transport, but not so badly that the cell dies. Uh, yeah, that's the thing that gets me is that the sort of therapeutic index, it seems to me, would be tricky. Uh, yeah. It's hard to imagine something like this, indeed, something indeed. like this, making it uh, sufficiently inhospitable to uh, uh, inhibit a virus infection without killing a cell. This is more like the way we approach cancer yeah, right, than the right. way we would normally approach infectious disease drugs. Mm. Right. I mean, because cancer chemotherapy yeah, is all about right. killing right. cancer right. cells without killing healthy cells and mostly. Right. So in that paper, they had identified. Yeah, of course, it has side effects, too, if you give too much of it. Hmm. In that paper, they had identified a plasma membrane protein, which they thought was the target of the drug, if you remember. And and you and you just said, Dixon, wow. you think the ATPase was the target and so forth. So I wonder why that you right. – the screens they did, and I just don't remember what they are now. The screens they did focused in on this one protein and um, – it was all consistent with that being a target, but he's, I, I agree, it doesn't have to have a target. But, but maybe yeah. if, you know, proton transport is affected, then, then a particular target that does that, depending on your assay, will, will pop up as positive, right? That makes sense to me. Sure. Now, those are uh, lysosomes, et cetera, aren't they? What is? When they fuse, they, there's a proton pump that actually works at that point mm -hmm. to acidify it. So to me, one of the key uh, experimental approaches to identifying a target is to find uh, resistant mutants. Yeah. Okay. Now, in this particular case, since uh, apparently you're inhibiting host Good functions, point. you wouldn't expect to find viral right. escape mutants, which just says they don't. But I wonder if you can uh, do tapeworms uh, do, uh, uh, develop resistance to this. They just dissolve. They just dissolve right. because their ATPs are also producing a um, a response against your digestive enzymes. So, but it could be that it if does. there's no specific target for this thing, if it's strictly a biophysical experiment, right. you're not going to get any resistance. Yeah, I thought that I they you. identified you. changes in this target that um, made it resistant to the. So it was defusing COVID nineteen, right? That was the name of the episode. Right. Um, TMEM16 inhibitors block syncytium. So they say that niclosophide inhibits TMEM16, but maybe it's because of a broader effect on proton, proton transport, as Andreas is mentioning. Well, I haven't listened to that episode uh, yet since I was out of town, so <laughs> I will listen to it and report back to you All right. with, with <laughs> this you. insight in mind. Okay. 
Because I'm sure you guys all forget it, too. Yes. (laughs) Well, the thing is that they may change the mode of action of this drug as the results of these studies. (laughs) Very interesting. (laughs) Rich, can you take the next one? Andrew writes, hi, Vincent. I figured this may be of interest to you. Thanks, as always, for providing great uh, info. Uh, A comparison of vaccine efficacy, though they conflate efficacy with effectiveness in the title, using absolute risk reduction instead of relative risk reduction, and gives a link, um, which I haven't looked at yet, I will, but maybe you guys have looked at it. Uh, And it's Andrew who describes himself as a Southern California aerospace engineer and a 14 month TWIV listener. You know what the weather is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I thought this was really interesting about, so it's a good explanation of vaccine efficacy, which they say it's generally reported as relative risk reduction. It uses the relative risk, that is the ratio of attack rates with and without a vaccine, which is expressed as one minus the relative risk. And that's where you get 95%, 90%. They have all the numbers for all the vaccines. However, it should be seen against the background risk of being infected or becoming ill, which varies between populations. And that's where the absolute risk reduction comes into play, which is the difference between attack rates with and without a vaccine. It considers the whole population. And he says they tend, the authors say, they tend to be ignored because they are much less impressive. For example, the Moderna uh, ARR is (laughs) 1.2%. And the J&J is 1.2%. Gamalaya is 0.93. Pfizer is 0.84%. So, can you imagine? <laughs> hey, one point two percent absolute and risk then reduction. Trying to explain why that's good. <laughs> yeah, so they ignore it, and this article talks about why uh, the absolute risk reduction is actually very important. And I, I really thought it was good, so I would suggest everybody check it out. That's cool. cool. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Um, we're up to Lowen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lowen writes, hello, TWIV team. Firstly, thank you for taking the time to put out such a helpful and useful podcast, not only for SARS-CoV-2, but for other aspects of virology as well. It's been a great resource of information for me as a new graduate student who doesn't have much of a background in virology. I'm emailing from northern Indiana, where there has been snow today in late April, after listening to TWIV 743 on shape-shifting viruses. I really appreciated the discussion of viral particle shape and the possibility of spherical viruses potentially being an artifact of culture was also a learning moment for me. Going off of that, I wanted to ask if this has implications for what we currently know about IAV or other viruses, particularly in terms of infectivity, neutralization, or vaccine and therapy development. Thank you, Loan. Um, hmm. Influenza A viruses. Um, Influenza A virus, yeah. They are well studied with respect to particle shape and... Um, Lone, we, we talked a little bit about that in the episode. Um, it's, you know, for influenza virus, you can select viruses that um, are more resistant to these filamentous forms and they have changes in, in certain genes. So it's actually well studied there and there's a literature on it. Um, we never talked about it actually, but we mentioned it a bit in that episode. Um, I mean, the, the, the outcome of that episode was that yeah, they bind better because they're longer and they have more yeah. interaction with the cell surface. But what it means for, you know, in, in clinical specimens, you tend to see mostly these um, filamentous viruses. So the, the spherical shapes are kind of cell culture artifacts in a way. They don't reflect what's going on in people. I don't know if, how many viruses that's the case, though. Influenza, filoviruses. I guess in that paper we did uh, also... Um, paramyxoviruses were in that paper as well. So, Dixon, can you take the next one? You bet. Mark writes, dear Twif, Twivmeisters, it is currently 29C85F drizzling and 70% humidity. Well, it's drizzling. It's 100% humidity, isn't it? In Bangkok. The number of reported cases has been rising to about 1,000 to 1,500 per day for the past month and a total of 45,000 reported cases and 108 deaths out of a population of 70 million since the beginning of the pandemic. That's rather low. 
There is a policy requiring anyone who tests positive by RT-PCR to enter a hospital for 14 days, even if the person has no symptoms. Wow. Most of the hospital beds are not in isolation wards, and new field hospitals, such as the one shown in the photo, put large numbers of SARS-2 positive tested people together. My question is whether this practice constitutes an unnecessary risk for creating potentially dangerous variants. The case mortality ratio is very low, so it seems to me the best thing to do would be to hospitalize only those patients who are at high risk. In my view, they should be using rapid antigen tests rather than RT-PCR for screening. Hmm. How do you see this? Vaccines are not yet widely available. Thank you for your ongoing work to educate the world about virology. All the best. Mark from Bangkok. Thoughts? That's really pretty. I think 100% humidity would be fog, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> drizzle, drizzle is rain. <laughs> yeah. I think that's pretty draconian to put anybody who's positive in the hospital for 14 I days. I would agree. And then how do you get that many people into a hospital? I mean, that's Well, seems you put like them a in a special people. SARS-CoV-2 or COVID ward. Jeez, um, whiz. Hmm. Yeah, I... I I assume, I assume the reason they're doing this is because they're concerned that it would be too difficult to enforce quarantines otherwise. But this seems like it's going to encourage people not to get tested. Um, I agree with that. Creating a different yeah. problem. Yes. That's right. Um, I don't see the hospital environment necessarily as uh, fomenting variants. No, I mean, by the no. time you, oh, by the time you so. land, you're already infected. That's and right. and it's not as if it's creating a, a space where uninfected people are going to get uh, yeah. infected. Right. right. Okay. That, so I don't see that as the problem, but I agree with you that uh, it strikes me as over the top in terms of, uh, you know, treatment, except for what's already been measured, uh, mentioned, which is that, uh, you know, it uh, uh, ensures quarantine. Right. Uh, 70 million population. Well, they've had very few cases, although maybe. Very few. Yeah, maybe. 26,000. Yeah, that's because nobody wants to get tested, nobody right? Nobody wants to get tested. Maybe. They may have a lot more cases. <laughs> you know, Perhaps, but not a lot of people are dying from this either, though. I bet yeah, they have many, many more cases than they know. Yeah. yeah, I bet they do. I mean, weeks ago, people were saying, why does India have so few cases? Well, here's why. Uh, because they didn't uh, test yeah. enough, uh, right? They didn't, yeah. Um, this is true. So, it would be interesting to know what Thailand's, uh, and especially Bangkok's, um, positive test rate is. Yes, mm. it would. So that's a very that's a fairly sensitive way to determine if you're testing enough. You should have positive test rates that are below 5%. Mm -hmm. um, if it's much higher than that, like it was early in the pandemic here and pretty much everywhere, I mean, we had it's like 50% of the people who showed up to get tested were positive because um, we weren't here's testing enough. some data... Um, Tests taken, 67,000 positive tests, 2,300 positive percent, 3.5 percent. Oh. Okay. That's not too bad. That's low. That's low. That's, um, hmm. You'd be allowed in a restaurant in that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I, I I mean, yeah, the the objection I have is that it was, it's an extreme measure and could cause uh, perverse incentives. I mean, it sounds like from the positive test rate, maybe enough people are getting tested or maybe testing is mandatory in so many settings. Well, and wow. the, they have room in the hospitals to do it. Maybe. And they, yeah. if they can yeah. do it. Okay. And it All right. I, I don't know. I, and I don't know what the enforcement situation would be like if you didn't do that. Um, but it would be preferable yeah. to quarantine people at home if you so could. So variants arise spontaneously in the population, and it doesn't matter where you are. It's going right. to be. It's just going to happen. And the variant is going to arise at the in an individual. That's right. Like somebody's going to cough out that variant as we saw spreading. as we saw last week, right? With that single genome sequencing analysis, yes. they arise individuals. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's um, quite an interesting situation. I. I yeah, he says, it's not the way I would do it, but I can't really say that it's wrong because I don't know what the situation is. It seems to me his yeah. suggestion of using antigen testing is probably a good idea. That way you wouldn't hospitalize sure. so many people, right? But Yeah. Hey, did you see it? You can now get uh, 10, 12 buck antigen tests here in the yeah. U.S. They're not a buck, but better than nothing. All right, well, one... I you need your whole genome sequence for that. <laughs> <laughs> for 10 bucks? No, I don't think so. And if you're not, in the we're UK, not quite there yet. Coming to a CVS near you. <laughs> if you're in the UK, you can get tests for free. 
Yeah. Right. That's right. nice. That's right. That is right. All mm-hmm. right. You read to Anne writes, Hello, Daniel, Brianne, Kathy, Amy, Alan, Rich, Dixon, and Vincent. My equanimity is upset every time you say there's no need for the Janssen vaccine since everyone can get mRNA vaccines. This is not true now for many people in rural areas, for homebound people, and definitely not for many poor countries. I'm surprised by this since you usually do consider conditions in the rest of the globe. We are too retired on Cape Cod, and the Cape had a lot of trouble getting the vaccines here. Although we have the oldest population, Barnstable County was getting drips and drabs. Once Janssen became available, it became possible to have enough vaccination clinics so we oldsters could get vaccinated. We were very pleased to get Janssen. With the suspension of Janssen, why not a warning and let people decide with advice from physicians? Several of the clinics have been canceled. Hey, that's just what they're doing. (laughs) It's up to you and your doc. This is a consequence of the suspension you do not seem to be considering. Just saw, heard, gorilla episode, really interesting. Rita and Les, retired PhDs in physiology and physiological zoology from Woods Hole, where it is actually sunny and warm 50s for us. Addicted to TWIV, but you are out of TWIV hats. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, um, we are, we apolo- I apologize. We shouldn't do that because much of the world, yes, are not being uh, sufficiently vaccinated. I, I Did we say the agree. Janssen vaccine was not necessary? Uh, D- Daniel Griffin said uh, when the f- suspension first occurred that it, w- it represented a small fraction of the vaccines given out in the U.S. and it wouldn't make an impact here. And, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, in, in, that, that I in that narrowly defined discussion yeah. right so right. it wasn't i think right. what he what he meant was it's not going to derail our nation's current yes, vaccination that's push correct at this moment that's correct no. um but he, I, I i don't i can't speak for him but i i doubt he intended to say ah we don't need that vaccine no, at all no, no, no. But it is going down i mean I we have to admit that we're vaccinating a lot fewer people this week than we did last yeah. week and the week before. Uh, well, the, uh, the, a point that is being made here is that uh, even in our own country, yeah. we have uh, pockets yes. of, uh, we have uh, sure. parts, sure. Uh, portions of the population that in particular could benefit from a one shot vaccine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and in so, fact, I had a, I had a pick a couple of weeks ago, I think that was a, a little video about, um, uh, people getting vaccinated on Smith Island in Maryland. Yes. Ah. Right. And the only way to get off Smith Island is by boat. So you have to pay for the ferry each way to get And then they had an interview with a Smith Islander, because um, that's how you say it, <laughs> who um, <laughs> was there saying it was great that she could, they, they came to her, they brought the vaccine out, and, and she and her mother were able to get vaccinated with the, with the Janssen vaccine, which was the one shot. So it, makes, it definitely makes a difference for rural communities in the U.S., Yes, we have slowed our immunization efforts here uh, in the U.S. We are giving out 2.55 million doses per day of the last seven days compared to 3.38 million on April 13th. Why is this? Do we know? Do we understand? I think people are, uh, uh, the people who want it the most have got it. Uh, yes. That's true. Okay, we're starting to work on people who aren't quite so sure. Yeah. So what's happened is there was this initial demand vastly outstripped supply, and so there was a line. Mm-hmm. And all these people, millions and millions of people, were basically standing on line waiting for their vaccine, and now we've finally gotten through the line. Yeah, that's um, true, that's true. And now we're down to people who, who are thinking, well, it was, I couldn't schedule it. I went on the website and it crashed and, you know, all the early problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. And eh, maybe I'll, I'll get around to it and... And so we're dealing now with that. And, and of course, you know, now the number of doses delivered is going to come down a little bit because you don't have this constant supply of people mm. filling all your available spots. And you've got fence sitters that, you know, I still need to know. There are also, there is, there is some population of people who are actually hesitant. I don't know that we have reliable stats on who is really hesitant and who just yeah. hasn't gotten around to it yeah. yet. So in this <laughs> regard, I would point out, uh, and I'm sure that this is just, uh, that this is more widespread than this, that uh, just, uh, what, three days ago, uh, the major supermarket chain in Texas, HEB, which has pharmacies uh, as well, announced that they're taking uh, walk-ups for COVID vaccine. Good, 
Okay. So in lots of places, at least here, and my guess is in lots of other places, you don't have to make an appointment anymore. Yeah, right. You can walk up and get vaccinated. And then I hope that, that, that people will take advantage of that yeah. and that it will That's make good. it easier. I think in Massachusetts, we still actually have a little bit of a crunch because um, Bay Staters are pretty enthusiastic about this. Mm. So there, mm -hmm. there's been, there, there's still, a, but in coming weeks, I think we're going to see widespread availability of the vaccine. The total number of doses delivered each week may decline, but you're just going to see a steady pace of people getting around to it the way they do with a flu shot. Well, our 320-somethings now have been twice vaccinated, so Good. that's all cool here in New Jersey. Uh, what we, are, we are just waiting on the on the Moderna or Pfizer approval for the 15-year-old in the mm -hmm. house now. 70% of the people over 65 have been vaccinated. Yep. What uh, what do we think of the new uh, mask regulations outdoors uh, announced this good. week by the CDC? Good. Good. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Because I in think a crowd, you wear your mask. If you're not in a crowd, have fun. Uh, yeah. And I think that uh, I, I'm sure that it is well considered. Certainly makes sense relative to everything uh, I know. And I think one of the good things is that uh, it, is uh, an incentive to get vaccinated. Right. Alan, right. What, what about this thing in Massachusetts where you had to wear masks outdoors even if there was nobody else around? Yep. Is that still in? I they mean, just ended it today. <laughs> we had we had the most extreme mask mandate. You had to, outdoors. if you were yeah. off your property, you had to be wearing a mask. It was widely disregarded. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I live in a suburban area and I would go out for a walk and nobody's wearing a mask when they're out on the street. But as soon as they came, you know, up to an area where there uh, might potentially be a police car pulling up, <laughs> it's pull on because sure. there was a $300 fine attached to that. Ouch. Um, so I, I don't know that that was enforced anywhere outside of major cities, but it was, uh, it was in place and it has now been lifted. And this is totally in line with the data. We now know enough about this virus to say outdoor transmission is rare. And That's when right. outdoor That's transmission right. occurs, That's it's right. because you packed 50 people together into a space yeah, yeah, and they yeah, were all yeah, talking. Yeah. And yeah. Um, That's right. That's right. so I think it's totally sensible to lift this and it's encouraging people to get outdoors, which is something people true. ought to be doing. Very true. I still wear mine because I eventually have to go inside where I'm going to have to wear it. So might as well put it on. I see still in New York, but I say about 80% of people are still wearing masks. They are. It's interesting. Maybe just out of habit. Yeah, I think also uh, news spreads reason slowly. reason you said, if you're going to go on indoors, you might yeah. as well. I mean, I come out of my car and I put it on because I'm going to come two minutes later into here and we have to wear it inside. So, so yeah. in the restaurant yeah. I took my wife to, uh, they have these glass petitions now between the tables. And once you sit at the table, apparently you were okay to take off your mask. Hmm. How else are you going to drink a glass of yeah, wine? Yeah, of course, you have to that? take it off. <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna to have a so hard time eating through that. All right. the, uh, the people who were serving the meals, et cetera, all wore masks and they were all uh, in compliance. So we felt pretty safe. Here's another question for you, folks. The U.S. just announced yes. they're going to restrict travel from India. What do you ah. think about that? Ha. Ah. Good luck. I think it's not necessary. They say in light of I the variants, and agree. I'm going to show you why that's silly by my pick today. But yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with it. Well, and it's variants. it's just like when they, you know, we're going to keep people from China out. Yeah. I think you that's know, a year ago for Exactly. Exactly. I, I just know. don't think that. We, we have plenty of <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 here already, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. The horses have left the barn and are now rollicking in the fields. <laughs> yeah, this is – I the travel restrictions thing, I mean, I've been – I've been critical of a lot of travel restrictions ever since we were covering Ebola. Canada has bad um, ones right now. And and it makes sense to restrict people from packing into an aluminum tube together when you've got a respiratory virus. So that aspect of a of a travel restriction, just the act of travel is dangerous. Um, but this notion that, oh, we're going to stop the bad thing from coming here by restricting people from tra – no, it's they're, already here. It's already here. Um, the provinces of Canada. And if you're, worried, if you're worried about variants 
Um, oh my gosh. Oh, don't get me started on the interstate travel restrictions we had in this country until very, very recently. <laughs> that's like, true. That's true. I live, I could walk to Connecticut from here and I just constantly, I mean, some of the stores we go to are in Connecticut and we're in Massachusetts. And I guess maybe because we have a Republican governor, I don't know why, but Connecticut <laughs> decided that Massachusetts was unclean to it. So in retaliation, Massachusetts decided Connecticut was unclean to us. Right. And and so we had this thing going on where technically if you went to Connecticut and spent more than 24 hours, which my wife does every week, um, you, I mean, she had to go through a rigmarole and, and it was just, yeah. So inter interstate or interprovince travel restrictions within a country are not workable hard to any enforce. place I'm familiar very, with. Very hard and enforce. these international restrictions, I, I don't think are going to be productive in most cases. The notion that you're going to stop the variants from coming from India. What about the variants that are arising in Americans? Right. Well, are we stopping point. the yes. one that we just detected in California a few weeks ago? Yes. Uh, no, no, it's crazy. No. It doesn't make any sense. And, and no, the point is that we're hardly sampling in India. We have no idea what fraction of all the None. infections are variants. What's going and on. you know, That's right. you see the headlines: double and triple mutants. Yeah, maybe they found one. <laughs> You have no idea. Right. So that's right. not a good it, it reason. It may have significance or it may not. And it, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. No, I, I do think it's appropriate to have, if you've got some place like, um, like Hawaii as an island, I mean, they can actually contain things pretty well. And or it's kind of appropriate <laughs> for them to say, you know, we don't want people <clears throat> flying into the state with it when we're just getting it under control here. Um, or in the case of New Zealand, where they eradicated it. Right. Yeah. Right. But and it came so back. It came to, back a few times. It did a few times, but they were they were on top of it. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Because they eradicated, they were able to lift all their restrictions. And if you That's have true. a situation like that, then it makes sense to say, okay, nobody come here because um, we don't have any protections in place because we you, have eradicated Alan, you have no idea of how much money they lost in fishing tourism. Oh, oh, yeah. No, they I, lost they, a bundle. They, they lost have, a they bundle. They have lost plenty out of this, but they got the virus under control that is all true um, that's the main thing that counts you know so those are there are very specific cases where travel restrictions make sense but if you've already yeah. got the virus circulating like we do and you're afraid that the particular brand of virus that's coming from someplace else is going to be different then i think that's no that's that's nonsense even in china they said you could come you just has, have to quarantine for two weeks yeah. that was a while ago so mm. all right let's do some picks dixon what do, do you have for us I have a pretty standard pick. I love these contests that they have. This is a microscope uh, optical company, Olympus. They make cameras and microscopes and telescopes and things of this sort. So they have a life science competition every year, just like uh, uh, Nikon has. And this is their winning year for 2020. And the pictures are astounding as usual. And they're just, it's so comforting to see the depth at which people who are studying science and doing experiments take time to say, my God, that's so beautiful. I can't believe the symmetry of that, or I cannot believe the diversity of that, or I can't believe all of these things are art and science all at once. And uh, I, I just over, I'm overjoyed with looking at them. It just lifts my spirits. And the winner needs to be a Halloween poster. <laughs> Probably that's nah. right. That's exactly right. I agree the with you. The rad embryo. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely, really, really good. Absolutely. I they're like beautiful. the neurons. They're beautiful. They're all astounding. They're astounding. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. one that well, I, I like them all, but the one that really struck me is this uh, one that's a three D reconstructed immunostaining I image right. of astrocyte. Blah blah blah. And I looked at it and I thought, <laughs> my God, this looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. Exactly. And sure enough, you look at the title it's and it's called, called Pollux, <laughs> Pollux Clea. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's nice. true. That's true. Very cool. Beautiful stuff. Nice. Thanks, Dixon. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I have another downer pick, but um, this is one that I think is an important topic before before all of our pandemic listeners move on. Um, maybe we ought to go ahead and raise this. This actually came out in January. Uh, it's an opinion piece from Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, by Danielle Simoneshi, um, who talks about something that's really an open secret in uh, biomedical research. Um, 
The title is We Need to Improve the Welfare of Life Science Trainees. And this is a discussion of the, um, the postdoc treadmill and the, um, the ongoing issue of people who are just in perpetual temporary employment despite having or perhaps because of having um, doctoral degrees and doing the backbone of the biomedical research. What's so, the solution? Right what's the solution, Alan? What's the solution? Well, I've, we've actually on back <coughs> episodes of TWIV, we've discussed uh, a few, but um, I don't know long term. Uh, I think the staff scientists move that's been gaining some momentum is, is a step in the right direction. Um, I think people have proposed PhD birth control, which uh, <laughs> would limit the number of people you take in as, as graduate students. Um, you know, they're, all of this is, is fraught with difficulty and conflicts of interest because the people who have the authority to change the process are the ones who benefit from the current process. Yes, and yeah. so, of course. I mean, that, that's the problem, that they are viewed yes. as hands to do your experiments to get your grants renewed, and that's not what they're supposed to be. Right. Well, that's all true. Um, but this new budget... And uh, it's very hard uh, to change that because yeah. if you don't have those hands to do your experiment to get your grant, then you're not going to have a grant. You can't be able to pay those hands. And so... All of the above. All of the above. It's, a, it's an interlocking set of problems. And this article does not purport to solve that, but uh, she does a very nice job laying out what the issue is. And I think for lay listeners or those who are thinking of going to graduate school or those who are in graduate school, um, you, you may find it enlightening to read this. Yep. So do you think if we had 2% expenditures towards science and technology rather than the 1% that we have now, it might make a difference? We doubled the NIH budget back in the aughts, and here we I are. I remember. Yeah, but right? you, but I mean, the problem is if you have a system that's set for logarithmic growth, um, then you're going to have to have a logarithmically increasing budget infinitely into the future. Yeah, well, that and that's work. not that going to be sustainable. Um, no, but is this a low point or is this a, an intermediate point or is this a high point in terms of job availability and job uh, security? I, right. We don't know. I think what, what would, this would take would be a restructuring of science um, to operate the way the, the military industrial complex operates, which is a jobs program, right? Uh, that's the U.S. military is a jobs program. And unfortunately, it has not been structured that way and probably can't be. And, you know, maybe if we spent the money on science instead of bombs, we'd be in a better place. But this is how our priorities are. You know, much of the doubling of the NIH budget didn't actually go directly to supporting research. A good amount of it no, went no, to building right. new that's buildings right. that the university There's said, that. whoa. Program projects yes. rather than individual grants. Look at all this money. Let's build a new building. But the right. fundamental issue is even if you doubled, even if you doubled it and, and earmarked it in a way that it had to go to paying people, hmm. um, you know, the, the actual lab workers, then all that would happen is 10 years from now, we'd be having the same discussion. Yeah, sure. I because agree. if every PI trains 10 replacements for that PI, then you've got to grow the budget tenfold per generation. I agree. Yeah. However, I, I think at 37 billion, the NIH budget is just way too low. And I agree. for what we get from it, I mean, look at these vaccines that yes. came so quickly, mainly from NIH funded research over the years. And 37 billion just is ridiculous for that, right? It should be much more. Sure. I agree we don't have to keep it logarithmic growth, but man, we need more than we have now. And many I, I of the think, problems- I think what we need is a combination of a structural change so that we don't have this endless growth yeah. and yeah. a boost in funding so that we can sustain the level of employment for sure. the current staff. Um, and I'm kind of hoping, I've, I'm more of a pessimist than this, but usually, um, but <laughs> I'm kind of hoping that maybe now that we've spent, you know, multiple trillions of dollars on fixing this whole mm -hmm. pandemic thing and we're still trying to climb our way out of it, uh, this would be the time to have that discussion. Right. And the NSF got huge boost, an enormous boost. Yeah. Well, they have so little to so begin with. Any boost for them is a true. huge boost. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, it's right. all about environmental sciences and it's all about saving the world and that sort of thing, too. So uh, that's good stuff. You, you got to work at both yeah, ends, I think. It, that should not be administration dependent, though, right? That's crazy. No. Correct. 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 <sighs> anyway, thank you, Alan. That's good. Sure. Uh, Rich, what do you have for us? So in uh, catching up on episodes that I missed, 
and listening to TWIV 745 with Nadine Lamberski. <laughs> I perked up when she talked about working with an elephant rescue organization in Kenya because a few years ago, my daughter gave me an elephant for Christmas, <laughs> right? Uh, which basically... Uh, consists of a sponsorship for a rescued elephant. And I was curious as to whether this was the same facility. So I wrote Nadine and she wrote back and no, it is not the same facility. So I thought I'd plug both of them. Um, the one that she works with is called uh, the, uh, hang on, I've got it there in the pic, the Riteti Elephant Sanctuary. And it's in Northern Kenya. And the one uh, uh, through which I adopted an elephant uh, is, whose name is Moktau, by the way, uh, <laughs> is in southern Kenya. And it's called the uh, Sheldrick uh, Wildlife Trust. Uh, and both of these organizations, uh, their websites are amazing. Have a look. Both of these organi yep. organizations are dedicated to, uh, you know, preserving uh, threatened uh, species it starts out with elephants, but it expands to all sorts of other species. And uh, the rescue pro exactly. programs are particularly uh, interesting where they uh, identify uh, injured or uh, uh, often orphaned young elephants, uh, orphaned because of poachers or for uh, other reasons, who they then rescue and bring into their facility and raise them, uh, but with the uh, objective ultimately in mind of being able to re-release them into the wild, at least into uh, one of their parks. So have a look and uh, support yourself. Uh, adopt an elephant, okay? Cool. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm inspired to... Uh, up my um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, contribution to Mocktow's uh, benefit. That's cool. Do you get to find absolutely an elephant? It, How's she, she doing? She's she, doing great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How big is she now? I, How much does she gain? I, I can't tell you quite that. But <laughs> do you she's, get, do you get I pictures? I looked her up in preparation. Yeah, you get pictures, uh. and they'll send you stuff from email and all the, you know, you get email updates on them and that hey, kind of stuff. Cool. And you can have videos of your elephant frolicking around with the other elephants. Very nice. When do they start school? And you, and you don't have That's to, you don't have to necessarily uh, <laughs> do the uh, buy an elephant thing. I see you can earmark a donation for their aerial surveillance program. They've got uh, some cool, cool bush planes. I mean, you know, they, uh, they identify the these, uh, they identify these animals and they go in and uh, you know, uh, medevac them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stick them in a helicopter yeah, and yeah. bring them back. When uh, Mocktow showed up, uh, she was uh, seriously dehydrated mm. and they had to uh, yeah. put a drip on her. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, enormously costly. Elephant formula yeah, is right. something like 450 bucks for a week or something like that. It's it's very rich in fat. Very, very so rich. Loading an elephant into a helicopter, you're talking big bills. <laughs> wow. Right. And, and when you earmark yeah, an elephant, so boy, boy that's do you ear. earmark <laughs> an elephant. <laughs> that's a big ear. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was for you, Kathy. That was for yes. you. <laughs> yes. Kathy, what do you have for us? I, I picked something that a friend of mine sent me a while back. Uh, so Mark is a physician who retired in September of 2019 and then unretired when the pandemic hit. Um, in fact, he was, uh, he went to Washington uh, to see Adelaria, I think. Anyway, he sent me this. Uh, I know him also from singing and it's a podcast called Aria Code and it has uh, Rhiannon Giddens and, um, and she has three guests on this particular one, hmm. which is on, it, entitled Puccini's Turandot. Hope never sleeps. And they talk about, you can say it, Turandot or Turandot or da or whatever, with or without the T. Um, and uh, the three guests are really what, what make it because um, it ties in uh, the music, uh, a classical music critic. A, so a conductor, a classical music critic, and a pulmonary and critical care physician at Brigham and Williams Hospital. And... So they're each interspersed with various things about the history of Nessendorma, uh, and it's the thing that gets us through the darkest moments, knowing that the sun will rise again on a new day. Mm. So, uh, you know, there isn't a 
stronger earworm than (laughs) Nessendorma. It's kind of getting me now, but um, it's a, it's a really good, uh, about 30 minutes, uh, just a very interesting podcast. So check it out. Nice. And then the second thing, there's even a shout out for Vincero. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, uh, It's, isn't it Vincero? But anyway, any, um, well, we could, the second, the second thing is, um, I finally looked up the, uh, caption on today's astronomy picture of the day, which is especially for Vincent Mm -hmm. because it's a picture of, uh, the perigee moon and the pink and the pink of course happens to be cherry blossoms yeah. Vincent's unfavorite. So this is an arc that if you haven't been yes. listening. Those are angiosperms, Vincent. <laughs> yes. Ours just finished blooming in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ours, ours is doing good right now, actually. Yeah. yeah. Good thing I don't have to go to D.C. these days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's tulip season where we are. <clears throat> uh, uh, Kathy, have they had the tulip festival up in Holland, Michigan yet? Uh, it's this weekend, yes. This weekend, cool. yes. I think it actually is two weekends, but I know this weekend is one of them. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. I love that. My pick is a website called Covariance. It tracks um, the various uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants in different countries with very nice graphs. So it's put together by Emma Hodcroft and others. And uh, you can go through and see... You know, how many of each variant have been detected and what fraction they are in the, of the population. Uh, for, so for you go to India, um, you know, you can pick different, you, you could just slide your mouse over the different parts of the curves. India's is very low because they're doing very little sequencing. And, um, you know, on any given time, these variants in India are a fraction of the total sequences they've only done uh, they only do four five hundred a week and you know i'm looking at one week where others is 339 and the uk variant is 74 and you know so 5484k so just put it in perspective you know many of these variants are small fractions some in some countries they're large fractions but it really depends on the number of uh, sequences that are done. Anyway, it's a wonderful site because it's got all the countries, all the variants. You can look at them individually. Um, So really good and it's updated frequently. It's all based on sequence data being being put out by the countries, mainly through GISAID, I think. But But um, this is the kind of comparison you actually need to determine if something is... Yeah. It does have a fitness advantage. Like, is it actually taking over um, as a proportion of the population? And this, this is really cool. Yeah, so when you hear about Not double, and, double a- and triple mutants in India, yeah, they get one or two sequences, but that doesn't mean very much. So because uh, they're not doing that much sequencing. Yeah, they're not doing they, a lot. I mean, I mean, it, in their defense, they're kind of busy. Right yeah, now. of course, of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Anyway, so, it's a great site. It's a great. I mean, site. Looking at these these graphs, it's almost this is an expression of art as sure. well to see how nature is behaving over time, <laughs> and you get you get. You get a different uh, feeling by looking at this data altogether. That's great. So it's uh, this is a nice illustration of the uh, fact that these variants do come and go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And go is probably as important as come. Okay. But um, uh, aside from a variant showing up and over time, gaining dominance. Is there any good population level data that suggests that any one of these are a public health issue or in terms of either uh, a greatly exacerbated disease or significant escape from existing immunity? I don't think so. So there isn't. No, if you remember early on, we talked about some data which suggested that the UK variant was more virulent, right? That was way back in like, I don't know, January. But a a Lancet paper has just come out saying there's really uh, no difference. And that's the best studied of all of them, I think. You know, that's been in more people than than any others. I don't know of any other data uh, with any others. Yeah, the... I mean, the problem is that in these situations, often you don't have good comparators. You have uh, the initial UK study that saw an apparent 
increase in virulence was not matched cohorts because they couldn't. And then when the variant has taken over and, or has become the dominant form in the population, you can't really compare groups because you don't have anybody getting anything else. Um, and, and so it's not been apparent. I mean, we're not seeing drastic spikes in mortality rates accompanying these so far. But one thing I would point out about this site, I mean, it, um, if you go to the, the overview of the, the, to the variants per country, um, for example, a, a lot of these are mapped as proportion of the total. And so you see these, these graphs, but bear in mind that they don't reflect the number of cases. Right. So in the U S <laughs> right now, we've actually got declining case counts. And as those decline, you may see an increase in proportion of a variant because you happen to have increasing cases in a particular region where that variant is prevalent, not because that variant has a specific advantage. So there, there are artifacts that could arise in this. But if you see sure, one that sure. is taking over in multiple countries consistently, um, like the, uh, the so-called UK variant, what, what were we calling it, 117? Mm -hmm. um, that um, they've got a different set of codes on this site, which is a little bit confusing uh, since we haven't standardized on any of those. But that, that particular variant does seem to have become predominant in many European countries for what it's worth. So likewise, what's the, what's the epidemiologic status of variants uh, escaping immunity? <laughs> Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about epidemiology now here. I'm not talking about whether or not a particular uh, variant uh, escapes or is less sensitive to serum in a laboratory oh, situation. Okay. Okay? So you want to know... I'm talking about, is a, do we have any evidence of, of a variant actually blasting through uh, an immunized uh, or uh, an immune population? Oh, okay. So I think the best... I, th I think the best answer is the, the vaccine trials, right? Whether uh, vaccines prevent um, infections or disease caused by any particular variant, right? And uh, so you, you you can go look at the trials. And the the, the telling one to me is the J and J trial in South Africa, where they had tenfold less neutralization with sera from their immunized people against the locals variant, yet. 100% protection against disease, against hospitalization and death. I think that's the best kind of study that you can do because those are the, the ones where they're following lots of people, yeah. right? Otherwise, it's really hard to do. So, you know, where I'm going with this is that there's this constant drumbeat of variants, yes. variants, <laughs> variants, variants. And yet, I don't see in the epidemiology really strong evidence that yeah, they exist. Yeah, they circulate. Yeah, they can become dominant. But uh, I don't see uh, any really strong evidence that it's having any kind of devastating Im impact on yeah. the on the spread of the virus or our ability to uh, mount population immunity. To it. I would agree with is that. that. Is that fair? I would agree with that. And in fact, there's a preprint. I'm I'm waiting for it to be a paper, but basically concludes that the the um, trajectory of the UK epidemic was not changed in any way by the variant. It would have been the same with the ancestor, the ancestral virus compared to the variant, right? So again, that's the best studied of all of them. But I think you're right. I don't, I don't see any major impact. To me, this is really important because like, for example, in these town halls uh, that, yeah, that we yeah. have, one of the most common questions that I get is people, people are uh, afraid of the variants because of all the news they get. And then they wonder, is my vac is my vaccination going to be any good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sure. But the, the data that I'm aware of says, uh, uh, yeah, we variation happens. Yep. We need to keep an eye on it because we don't know what's going to happen much the same as we need to keep an eye on viruses in bats, but there's no striking evidence right now that says that we're doomed because of variants. No, I think that, the key was the T cell story from Alessandro, right? Yeah. The T cell epitopes don't change. And so you still have T cells to save you in the end, right? And that's what I try and tell people, you know, don't worry about the neutralization assays. That's not really the key. The key is whether 
people get reinfected after vaccination. Most of them don't. CDC just had a wonderful study of millions of healthcare workers who have been vaccinated and just a few thousand got breakthrough infections, most of them pretty mild. So uh, I don't think, right. I think that's the message yeah, you can fact, give people. In fact, yeah. most of them were only detected because they're healthcare workers and being regularly tested. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. a lot of them were asymptomatic or minimally so symptomatic. The best answer to the question, why should I get the vaccine? Because the variants are all out there is that without the vaccine, you're sure to catch the variant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I, Rich, I think, uh, I think what we're seeing is we have unprecedented sequencing surveillance and we're seeing way more than we ever have before. And we don't quite know what to make of it, right? We don't know quite how to interpret this. <laughs> but, you know, there are tons of, uh, well, there are like 15 uh, HIV, they're called subtypes. And, you know, they diversified early on in the in the epidemic. And then depending on where the virus went, which subtype, so Africa has them all, right? And then every country got their own subtype and they predominate there. It's a similar kind of situation, but we that was in area, times when we did far less sequencing. So, yeah, I think that's going to be the, uh, the uh, lesson from this one. If you do a lot of sequencing, you're going to find a lot of, and the paper we did last week, Rich, you know, they do single genome sequencing in, in patients and you can see the variants coming up and the antibodies yep. bringing them down and then they go back up again in a single patient. It's very cool. <laughs> Which is why this whole notion of, uh, oh, we're going to restrict travel to keep the variants from showing up is silly. Because if you've got the virus here, you've got, you'll eventually yeah, have the variants showing up. And it, and I do think based on the other, on the common cold coronas, that we will see change over time that we'll be able to evade immunity. There's going to be pressure on the virus to do that. Um, and I don't know to what extent these variants have arisen for that reason or whether this is just random. But yeah, sure, at some point in the future, we're going to have SARS-CoV-2 that'll, that'll have evolved enough resistance to the herd immunity that we've all got from the vaccine or infection, and then it'll be able to spread but I expect it to become like the common cold coronas. Right. It's not going to maybe able to spread, but it's not going to necessarily gonna kill, kill you. No. Yeah. no. Okay. We have a listener pick from Justin. This is a New York Times, very nice uh, Times article, how Pfizer makes its COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, yeah. If you wanted to know behind the scenes how it's done, I got to tell you, it's not like the way we do it in the lab. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, see a, I see a distressing lack of duct tape here. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's really I great. Mean, they have all the yeah. plasmids is, have been frozen away and, you know, you start from a fresh tube of, oh my gosh. As a chemist, I just wanted to say, this is biological witchcraft and I love it. And he quotes, a single vial can eventually produce up to 50 million doses of the vaccine. I think that's one of the vials of plasmid they pull out of the freezer and then they amplify it. And it's pretty cool. Um, we, it's yeah. so impressive how squeaky clean and organized oh, these facilities yeah. are. Yes. I mean, they have to be, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, it's really, uh, actually, it's comforting to see. <laughs> it's also um, uh, impressive the, the travel history of these things. You know, there's what, three different facilities? Yes, they that go they all over, yeah. Go through yep. before they're actually uh, shipped out. It's incredible. Yeah. Yep. No, it's uh, it's yeah. Production uh, facilities production, really yeah. don't look like research facilities, do they? It's a whole different world, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm I'm very I think it's great, and it's obviously there are people who are really on this and get it to work and keep it going. Yep. I I have great respect because it's not something I ever would want to do or could no. do. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Justin. That's Twiv seven fifty. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier is at uh, trichinella.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent, and everybody else. A pleasure to be back on Friday. <laughs> yes, it is. But we will uh, have some more Tuesday episodes uh, in the future. Uh, Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Alan Dove's at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>